The Bible calls Noah a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. Now, you might say, what, what does this archaic story have to do with today and, and 2021 and the modern life that we're living? This uh, old, archaic, Mesopotamian tale of a great deluge and a great flood. And the modernist in his academia uh, totally makes fun of this story, this great ancient story, and paints it as a myth. But I find it very interesting that when Jesus describes the age of his return, he paints it as a parallel to the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So if you want to know what it's going to be like when Jesus returns, it will be directly like the days of Noah. Now the Bible, and and as it starts in the Torah, in the Genesis, we have an accurate description of the days of Noah. It says, and you know the verse. Let's quote it together. And when God saw the wickedness of man that was great on the earth and every intent of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he made man and he was grieved in his heart. Now that is a theological milestone. That is a very, very compelling and interesting scripture that everyone has to deal with. It shows, to, in my understanding, it shows a God who is sorry. It shows a God with a broken heart. Now, because of wickedness, because man was only evil continually in his thoughts and his imaginations, that it was that basically the sinfulness of man was perpetuating and getting worse. And God, who always wanted the best for mankind, is grieved over the lostness of mankind. And so it's a very sad story. It's a very, uh, it's like a milestone in your theology. Does, does the God of the, who's depicted in the Bible get exactly what he wants? It's a great question. There's whole theological camps that say, yes, God always gets exactly what he wants. And God orchestrates the world to be exactly how it is and as he decrees it. But Genesis 6 acts as this huge indicator. In fact, the, one of the first descriptions of the emotions of God in the Bible, in the narrative, in the story, is a God who is grieved. Now, remember, the law of first occurrence is very, very important. And if you apply the law of first occurrence to the emotions of God, we have a God who's brokenhearted over the sin of the world. But a God who's also wise enough to know that the only solution to sin is that of grace and favor. And so the story doesn't end with a brokenhearted God, but it says, but Noah found favor, grace in the eyes of the Lord. That is a huge, I'm so grateful that there's a break in that sentence. That it wasn't just that the man's thoughts were evil continually and that his emotions were wicked forever and that it was a perpetual broken cycle. But grace and favor came in to the situation. And grace always changes everything. Don't look at grace like a safety net. 
Don't look at grace like a get out of jail free card or a, a credit card or a license or liberty to go against truth, but rather view grace as an empowerment and as a teacher. Mm -hmm. The Bible says in the epistle of Titus, a small little book, which is very powerful. It says, but the grace of God, which brings salvation to all men has appeared mm -hmm. teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously and godly in this present age, looking on to the hope, the blessed hope. So grace is our teacher. So grace came into the situation with Noah and it changed everything. And grace and promise go together. And so Noah was instructed. He was given a promise and he was given a role and a responsibility in the fulfillment of the promise. What was Noah's role? He was a preacher. He was also a... He built the ark. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how big the ark is? <laughs> Anybody? It's over seven. It's over like 75 feet wide. It's like 45 feet tall. It's incredible. It's like seven or eight times longer than its width. It's huge. Have you seen that the, the, the modern day ark that they built? Where is that at? In the mid, in, and it's in like in the, you know, it's in the Bible Belt. It's like the, you know, the center of the Bible Belt, wherever that ark is. But I have yet to see it, but I've seen pictures. It's enormous. Can you imagine? You're, you're working on this giant boat and people are like, what is that? And you have to be like, judgment's coming. It's going to rain. What's rain? They don't even know. They never heard of it. Can you imagine the ridicule? Now you kind of understand why there's only eight people on the boat. <laughs> because in a sense, the whole watching world considers him crazy. There's a foolishness to it. Remember, the wisdom of God is to the world foolishness. And Noah, this preacher of righteousness, is having to stand alone against the mockery and rejection of the world. And yet his household was saved and brought in. And, and mo more than just that, God instructed Noah to cover the ark with what? Anybody remember? Pitch. Pitch. Now it's incredible if you do a study on this because pitch is also in Hebrew... The word for atonement. In fact, this is the story before the story. That it's through the atonement, through the pitch that, that, that basically preserved people from the judgment. That in the destruction and the, and, the, and the great cost of sin all around the world. And everyone's dying in judgment because of their sin. Evil continually. And the, and the story is, well, why did, it's not, the, the question is, why, 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 the question is not, why did God flood the earth? The question is, why did God save anyone? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? It was mercy. That he saved anyone. That man would continue. And so, but remember this pitch was a covering. It was a, a shadow. That's what we call a type. A foreshadowing. A, a story before the story. A, a, an indication of what's to come. Do you understand when, when, when this story happens... It's like this ark and this covering for judgment and for salvation of, of people on the earth. And do you remember the story of Moses? What did Moses' mother put him in? 
a basket of reeds, and she covered it with pitch. Once again, the story within the story. Atonement provides the way, God's way to save. When all the world around you is destruction and death and murder and it's evil continually, just like in the story of Noah, just like in the story of Moses, that there's salvation through atonement. God's way. God's way. He'll provide a way. And it's like that. Jesus, who is, the Bible says, the propitiation for our sins. The atonement for our sins. That God and man who are estranged, who are separated because of, their, because of sin, can now be at one again. That's, if you want to know the heart of atonement, it's that God and man can be at one again through what Christ did on the cross. Paul the Apostle says that through the blood of the cross, he's brought all things near. That there can be nearness again. That there can be reconciliation and forgiveness. That man can see the travesty and costliness of his sin. And God in his wisdom can wisely forgive and wisely pardon because of what Jesus did on the cross. So are you willing, like Noah, to stand against the world and preach righteousness? Hebrews picks up Noah and puts him in the hall of faith as a great testimony for the rest of the saints throughout the ages. Will you preach righteousness? If you preach righteousness, you'll receive the full rejection of the world. If you want to preach, if you want to be popular, preach prosperity. But if you want to be biblical, preach holiness. But you'll receive rejection. Notice in the Beatitudes, where does the rejection come? In the Beatitudes of Christ, we're hopefully we're memorizing. Where, where does the rejection come? In the Beatitudes. Well, go, go, let's go ahead and open up your Bibles. You're going to go to the greatest sermon ever told in Matthew chapter 5. Why don't you go ahead and, and read it? Will, why don't you read it pretty loud? And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mm -hmm. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall uh, obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Go ahead, what again? Those, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who are persecuted for what sake? Righteousness. Wait a second. Why would you be persecuted for righteousness sake? If you preach and teach a I'm a sinner, you're a sinner doctrine, the world will love you. If you preach righteousness, the world will hate you. You will receive the full rejection of the world. But Jesus says, blessed are you if you're persecuted for the sake of righteousness. There's a great psalm that says, I did not, I did not refrain from preaching righteousness to the congregation. Oh my God, I want that for my life. I want that for my life. I want that to be my testimony. Yeah. When, I, if, when I'm old and they put me on the ground, oh, that that could be put on my tombstone. Because the Bible says, I, the Lord, love righteousness. That righteousness is a pillar of his foundation and his throne. All the works of the Lord are done in righteousness. We need to be okay with not only living righteous, but preaching righteousness. Amen? Amen. Amen.
So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so we need to be mindful because we're ever approaching the days of Noah where people do exactly what they want, when they want, and how they want. And the only thing that is a sin in our culture is to be told no. <laughs> Every, it's like the only thing that is, is, is the thing to not do is to tell someone else what to do. You know, I'm a dog, I'm a woman, I'm a man, I'm a dog, Batman woman. You know, it's just like this insane culture. And the only sin culturally in our culture is to be told no. It's dangerous, folks. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Be a preacher of righteousness. Have a standard of holiness. It's getting so dark now, you don't even have to be a preacher of righteousness to reflect on other people's corruption. You just have to exist. You can not say anything and bring people under the conviction of sin. Wigglesworth would walk into carriage cars and people would, would be physically under the conviction of sin. Finney would walk into offices and people would physically be under the conviction of sin. Love righteousness. Do you know that's why they call him the Christ? Did you know that? We serve the master. And, for, and since childhood, you've said, you said, Jesus Christ. Right? The Messiah. The Christos. The Mashiach. Do you know why they call him the Christ? Hebrews. The epistle of Hebrews God says, speaking of Jesus, because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, God has anointed you above all of your brethren. The reason Jesus Christ was anointed and he was called the Christ. Remember, Christ is not his last name. But the reason he was the Christ, the chosen, the anointed one of God is because he loved the things that God loved and he hated the things that God hated. I see a church that's so quick to love, but has no lessons or understanding of what hatred is. The church needs to learn a holy hatred for sin again. We wonder why there's no more anointing. There's no more power. Where's the power gone? What if the power was connected towards your hatred towards sin? It says, because you have loved righteousness and hated iniquity, God has anointed you ab above all of your brethren. Which So there is a biblical precedent and link between a holy hatred for sin and an anointing that comes from God. Love the things that God loves. Hate the things that God hates. You'd be hard-pressed one in 10,000 sermons in our nation to hear a sermon on holy hatred. But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Amen.